Hi everyone, um, this video, well, it's just going to be a video that I had the urge to make suddenly about joysticks. Um, so I don't have all the joysticks I've ever had here, unfortunately. Um, I recently sold a whole bunch of them, uh, which was not really good timing, I guess, but um, I wasn't thinking of doing this video back in November. But I can still do quite a bit with what I've got left. Um, so I'm going to describe some of the differences in the mechanisms behind these joysticks and um, the ways that they work, uh, what makes for a good joystick in my opinion, and, um, and um, I'll probably touch on what others think makes a good joystick as well, just um, for completion's sake. <laughs> um, there are tons of bad joysticks out there. Um, so, in fact, a couple of them might even be in front of you on this table here, but, um, yeah, most of the ones that were really horrible I got rid of, but I can at least, um, explain what makes them horrible. Um, so, actually, nah, I don't have that here. I was thinking it might have the NES Advantage, which I could use as another, but nah, that's in a storage unit. Um, so yeah, um, here's a small collection of inputs, um, devices for Atari-style, um, joysticks. Um, I'm including a Sega Master System pad here. Uh, Mega Drive pads slash Genesis pads also will work. Um, except, of course, you only get the one fire button, um, with an actual Atari 2600, that is. Um, some other systems that use, um, a D sub input might support both buttons. But yeah, there's um, a certain amount that's standardized between these and a lot that isn't. Um, they all basically use a D sub miniature um, nine pin connector, um, which is because the original Atari 2600 used one of those. Um, this is an original 2600. Um, joystick that I've got, a CX-40 model. There is a CX-10 model out there, which I've never had the pleasure of trying, um, but people say they're better than the 40s, and to be honest, it's not a very high bar to uh, to um, make something better than the CX-40 Atari joystick, but um, <laughs> it does look nice. Anyway, um, so yeah, the default joystick that you would get with an Atari 2600 and that you can buy in a store for pretty cheap um, would probably be a CX-40 for most of its lifetime. And um, they're kind of crap. Uh, I can, I'm going to start taking these apart to show you the different mechanisms behind them um, and some of the reasonings for why they're crap. I forget if this one's actually physically broken internally or not, but it could be. So, um, one screw. Two screws. Three. And four. Some of these joysticks are also much easier to take apart than others. Like, a couple of them really try to fight you every step of the way. Some of them aren't meant to be taken apart, and so if you take them apart fully to do servicing, then um, you're going to run into trouble putting them back together. Um, even some of the most awesome joysticks have that problem. Um, this is not one of those most awesome joysticks, apart from the uh, historical importance of it and the um, generally pleasing aesthetic of it, in my opinion. All right. Yeah, this came with my uh, parents' old 2600. My mom and my aunt actually had one. Um, and see, so yeah, I got out of my grandparents' attic, and uh, it's mine now. <laughs> with permission from my aunt and my mom. But yeah, so um, I ended up getting one additional one of these controllers eventually, but this is one of the originals. Um, so yeah, you can see there's just a circuit board in here and these um, plates right here. Oh, I'll try to focus that for you, sorry. 
Um, these plates up here are um, steel domes that sit on top of this circuit board and they're using basically packing tape if not actually packing tape as an insulator <laughs> over this instead of something like a solder resist so that's um that's some clever cost cutting i guess <laughs> but yeah there's steel domes under each of these and for the fire button over here and um when they're clean and stuff they work okay um if it had a d-pad like a massive d-pad over it you even get a bit of a snappy feel from pushing down on these but um you don't really get that with the 2600 joystick or at least not the cx40 um so yeah um the big thing about atari joysticks is that they're all wired up in parallel like for a basic one at least um, some of them do special things as well, but to assure basic compatibility, um, each button is connected to one of these um, pins here, um, and one of them is the ground pin. And when um, you push down on the button, it grounds the button, and so that's what um, lets the console know that there's a signal, or like that you've pressed a button, because um, it, sees, it sees that... Um, a connection has been closed. Um, anyway, so it's a very simple design and I like it a lot more than things like NES controllers which you have to use like actual digital logic chips and stuff to um, decode them sanely. <laughs> you could probably do it with just transistors but I don't know if you could do it with passive components. It'd be tricky. Be like something you do as an esoteric kind of challenge, I guess, if you're a, a double E engineer. So double E meaning electrical engineer. Um, so the stick top itself flops around without this base in it. And um, feels more like an actual joystick should, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, and this piece sits underneath it. Um, let me change the lighting down a bit. Yeah, this piece sits underneath, and um, this one actually appears to be perhaps intact. A lot of them aren't. Um, I see little signs of stress on this, but there's no cracks, so that's good. Um, when you're playing forcefully, eventually um, you, you'll just snap one like around this plastic ring. This will start breaking loose. And then you can't press down on the buttons reliably unless you push even harder into the side of the joystick, which just accelerates the wear. Um, so, yeah, the, it's a very common problem for these to break like that. Um, thankfully, back in the day, they were extremely cheap. But um, you're just continuing to create more waste every time you do that. So it's not really something that I personally am a fan of um, as the consumer mentality goes um oh yeah and it pivots um with this point here it um pivots on this bump in the uh controller that goes right through the uh, center uh, yeah so yeah that that bump there and that's what it rocks on top of so now and for this button um, the spring I don't think can actually push down with enough force to actuate the um, the uh, steel dome in this case so it's actually I believe re relying on the uh, orange like peg of plastic in the fire button that sticks up through it um, you, you can see that in the center there I believe that's actually what triggers it um, although some designs do put a switch of some sort um, with a slider on top of it um, they'll, they'll put a slider and then a spring and then the switch and the spring pushes down the switch and makes it click 
Um, that's a design that actually a cup, one of the joysticks on this table uses. Um, it gives it a feel kind of similar to like a Model M keyboard or something, honestly, which I appreciate. Also a similar sound if the button is clicky. All right, so um, easy enough to put together though. Uh, they're very stiff. I mean, anyone who's used one knows, like there's very little movement in them. And it's sometimes hard to tell if you push down on the button. Even holding it up to my ear, I can't really tell. It's really hard to tell. Um, is that centered correctly to do it? No, it's off center. That's why. Okay, now it's centered. <laughs> All right, so we'll try this again. Uh, let's see. So the pegs in it should fall down like that. Okay, now if I listen for it with my ear right up against it, I can sort of hear a clicking noise. So now it's actually going to work as well as it ever does. Um, Commodore made basically an exact clone of this and later changed the styling of the case to avoid, I guess, copyright infringement. Um, I think Atari brought them to court and that's why they changed it. But um, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of joysticks out there that do this kind of thing, and it's usually just the cheap ones. Um, I do not recommend these, except for how handsome they look. So um, if you want to use one, I would suggest looking for a CX-10 instead, because people tend to say those feel better, and are just better in general. And um, Those were only made for um, around 1977 and maybe 1978 for um, early Atari 2600. Um, consoles, so they're a tiny minority of all the joysticks you'll find out there that Atari made for the 2600 and other computers in its lineup. Which is a shame, because apparently they're very much nicer. I just have never been able to find one to use at a reasonable price in person. <laughs> Actually, I've never seen one in person, period. Um, but I've never seen one at a reasonable price online when I was looking. I don't think they're that rare. I think they're just uncommon and people sort of know what they have or I'm just bad at looking or I'm not looking with the bad enough listings for like this Atari joystick, no other description. Those listings seem to be dying off now, unfortunately. It seems like people are doing research or having someone else sell their stuff or something's changed. But yeah, that's a shame. I liked it when people would just put something up with poor description and then it was your reward for um, going through 15 pages of searches and doing all those negative searches to um, <laughs> when you uh, were the one who landed on it and grabbed it for cheap. Um, yeah, so that's the 2600 joystick and it's kind of the granddaddy of them. Um, and the thing that all of these were seeking to replace, uh, except the Sega pad, because the Sega pad's meant for its own console. Um, although it does have a little cap that comes off and you can screw a um, thumbstick into there. I'd like the thumbstick, I just never had a chance to get one either. Um, so yeah, this is a very basic pad. If you've ever opened up an NES controller, it's rather similar. I just dropped a screw. There we go. The magnetic tip of the screwdriver pulled the screw with it off the table. All right. Um, <laughs> the Atari joystick lets some black plastic fragments out. That's promising. Um, so yeah, I'm going to open up the uh, master, uh, master System Pad just because it's been a minute or two since I've done it. And I don't remember everything about how it looks inside. Keep dropping it. Um, I 
I'm not sure if all of these, I don't think all these pads came with the thumbstick. I think maybe just the early ones did, and then they started just putting the cap in and not providing the thumbstick. I don't really know the whole story. So yeah, um, the, the um, Master System pads are a little interesting because as opposed to an NES pad where this is all just one circuit board, it has two, and also it uses a parallel connection instead of the NES's serial connection. Okay, so yeah, um, there's the button pads. They're, they're a lot like the graphite contacts in an NES pad if you ever opened one of those, only they're just exposed metal like the solder resist isn't on there on the circuit board. And um, then there's the carbon contacts on rubber pads here, um, which basically just the black part conducts electricity across these um, metal pads here and creates a, um, creates a signal. So most handheld game pads do this kind of thing. Um, also, a lot of joysticks will use like huge versions of these um, with the joystick centered underneath it um, and just push down on the pads like that. Um, some Tandy joysticks, or I don't know if they were Tandy or just Radio Shack branded, maybe realistic. I don't know. I know they were of the Radio Shack store brand for um, some of their joysticks. Um, some of those used that technique, and um, yeah, it works. It just doesn't feel amazing. It feels better than nothing, and it works okay, but it's kind of lacking. I'd prefer it over a um, 2600 stock controller, though, because those really are bad. Um, I might. I think I'll probably try to demo some of these controllers once I'm done explaining them all to you. And kind of show you what I mean. Also, age has not been kind to the CX40 like the um, Atari joystick, they um, they just didn't last as well, and um, I guess what I'm saying is um, maybe there's corrosion, maybe there's just oxidation in general, which I guess is corrosion, um, somewhere in there, and I don't think they were always as unreliable as they are now. Um, I do think they were always pretty bad and pretty fragile and everything, but I think they tended to work a little bit better in the past. Um, and it might be possible to get them going again if you either replace the steel domes, assuming you can still get those. I feel like you could last time I checked. Um, if you replace the steel domes and uh, maybe use some contact cleaner, or just use contact cleaner, that could be enough. Um... Sometimes I don't like magnetism on screwdriver tips. Right now it's getting in the way. Um, oops. That was just me though. All right, last two screws. And yeah, master system pads. Um, oh, another thing I should mention is um, not all joysticks are equal with, and you probably know this if you've used any of them, game pads and joysticks are not all equal with regards to um, how easy it is to move in the direction you're intending to. So um, you might notice even with the Switch Pro Controller D-pad, um, it's pretty easy to rock off-center and accidentally um, start going diagonally when you're pushing right or left or up and down. Um, and that's just bad design. And I think it's the thing that it rocks on, actually. And I stuck a couple layers of, of, um, of uh, what's it called? Um, like the cellophane type of tape. I mean, tape is one word, but that's a British term. Scotch tape is something Americans like to say, but that's a brand, so I don't like saying it. Um, well, yeah, that, that plastic adhesive tape stuff, um, the clear tape that you might use on a Christmas gift or something. Um, that stuff is, um, well, you can put a couple of small clippings of it, like, just stacked on top of each other in the center on the underside of the D-pad, and, um, it'll rock back and forth on that, and that somewhat fixed the problem for me. It just took a few tries to get it just right, which was pretty annoying. I didn't do the thing where I covered up half of the contacts, because that was making it so I wasn't getting contact easily. I just put the thing in the center. 
and I got the approval of my friend who's very particular about these things, so I think I did well. But yeah, um, some controllers like this make it way too easy to go diagonally, unfortunately, which doesn't always matter, but for something like an RPG, it feels like it does. Um, when you start going up when you're trying to walk sideways, just annoys the crap out of me. Um, and for a really precise shooter, it might also matter. Um, Hori actually sold in Japan um, a, I think they called it the SG-6 or something like that. Uh, it was basically a Famicom controller, but with a parallel connection on it and different color scheme, um, which had the Famicom style D-pad on it. I'd like to find one of those. Um, they were sold under the Sega branding in Europe, um, but not in America. So you could probably also get one from there, but it's called something else there. I forget what. Um, so yeah, uh, that leaves, I guess, three more sticks to cover. Um, I had a bunch more, and maybe I'll talk about them, but I'll be able to touch on most of the topics just looking at these three because all three use different mechanisms inside and, um, well, feel very different from each other. And these three are kind of the core of my video, I think. I don't really like this one, but I'll, so that's why I'll do it first. Um, the Suncom TAC-3, totally accurate controller is what TAC apparently stands for, um, number three. This is the TAC-2, which I prefer, um, but yeah. Uh, let's see if I can... Yeah, the stick just wobbles. And it's not a very <laughs> good feel. It also creaks. So yeah, that's not ideal. But I can at least show you the mechanism inside of it. And... Um, show you just a little bit of information about it. Uh, I found this at a local game store and it was the only one there that wasn't just like rubber pads or something like that. So um, it's what I ended up picking. And it worked. It worked pretty fine, honestly, for my Amiga, which is what I got it for. But um, now that I have these other two sticks, I've basically relegated this to my Amiga bin, where I just put my Amiga stuff when I'm not using it. Uh, which means under my bed. <laughs> um, yeah, so I popped this open. Just uses Phillips head screws. I added some grease here to try to make it creak less. It didn't work. Um, I probably just made it worse, honestly, by doing that. So I should probably clean it off while I'm in here. Be totally fair. Um, let me grab. There we are. Just a little bit of paper towel. The lubricant can trap like plastic dust and increase the amount of grinding that occurs over time. So, in hindsight, I probably wouldn't do what I did here again. It's the same reason I don't really recommend lubricating the insides of N64 controllers. Um, even though it sounds like a good idea, I guess, to try to make it run smoother and grind down less. Because N64 joysticks, if you weren't aware, um, grind themselves down to dust and that's why they get loose. Because um, the spring, the spring um, pushing them up against the top um, only is providing the upwards part. but. Um, I, I can't do this justice without taking it part one, so maybe I'll save that for another video. Or if I get through this fast, maybe I'll just do it now. But um, yeah, so it's got leaf springs, this, this controller. Um, so... <laughs> more lube. You'll notice the build quality um, varies greatly between controllers, but most of these things were meant to hit around a $20 price point. Um, there were some that weren't, like I think the Wyco sticks, W-I-C-O, which I do not have. 
unfortunately. Um, I think those sold for like 40 or 50 maybe in 1980s money. But um, they uh, are apparently really good. I've just yet to use one, yet to find one. I had an Epix 500J or something like that, um, which was a nice feeling micro switch joystick. I don't actually have one quite like that to show you today, but um, the, the basic housings of the switches would look kind of like this one's. I'm switching lenses so you can see better. Um, closer up. All right. And now, yeah. Yeah, there we are. So, um, hmm. try not to overexpose it too much, but also keep it bright enough to see. Challenge. Okay, um, yeah, so this doesn't use micro switches, not quite like you'd expect it to. Micro switches do look kind of like this. I can just show you what the typical micro switch looks like. Um, Um, something like one of these mouses, like computer mouse, a computer mouse has um, a similar switch design internally for its buttons typically, not always, but typically. Um, but these are just larger versions of those. And um, some of them come with these little leaf springs over top of them so that you push down and apply pressure on the uh, leaf spring and then that clicks the button. I think that's kind of called a limit switch as well. Um, but yeah, that kind of design was used in the Epix 500J. 500XJ. Yeah, I had one of these um, without the extra buttons. <laughs> one of these. And it worked okay, but the amount of force it took to press the trigger button was insane, unfortunately. Um, let's see if I can find an internal picture. Maybe I can't. I had one of these craft joysticks as well, but it was kind of broken when I got it, so I got rid of that. Someone took it from me, actually. Like, um, I offered it to them and they took it, so I hope they figure out how to get the thing open and fixed it. Um. Hmm. Maybe I should try a different search engine to save us some time here. I was not expecting this to be a hard thing to find. Yeah, I'm not actually clicking their video. And mine did not look quite like that in the inside, I don't believe, but that's a kind of similar clicking mechanism to what's in a micro switch. It's just weirdly adhered to a board. Um, anyway. Yeah, so it'll use things like that anyway. Um, and it'll have four of them arranged like so. Yeah, that's 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 what it that's what it is. So it's very similar to what I've got in front of me here. This just has a little clear plastic piece on top of the switches. 
Um, only mine actually uses leaf springs inside of a micro switch style housing, which is kind of odd. Um, so the, the difference being that these do not click when you push on them. It's just um, a springy piece of metal being pushed against another piece of metal to make contact inside which is very quiet. So if you like a quiet joystick, leaf springs might be for you. Um, it's also probably most similar to, a, to an actual arcade joystick, like a typical arcade joystick, I should say. Um, let's see, can I get that to go on without flipping it over? Why am I even trying? Let's, let's just flip it over, do what they want me to do. Oops, I put the uh, switch in backwards. <laughs> yeah, so it kind of lies about having three switches. They're all wired up to one button. It's so, like there's this button and then there's a button in the trigger. I mean in the stick itself, but that just runs down some wires into the same button. So whatever button you press, it's the same fire button. It's a one button Atari style stick, plain and simple. Which honestly was fine for most people. Um, going to go together. I guess that is together. Um, okay, so I'm putting this back, these back in then. And made in Taiwan ROC it says on it, on the underside. Suncom, I believe, was an American company in terms of where it was headquartered, or maybe that was just, if you were calling them for support, they had American offices. It could be they're actually Taiwanese or something. Anyway, so that's one joystick design, um, the TAC-3 here. And uh, it doesn't feel too bad to hold. The stick itself kind of creaks and um, is loose. So it's not my favorite stick, but it does respond. Um, diagonals are a little bit funky, though. Um, it doesn't really like to move in a clear circle. It sort of binds at the four corners like that in a box. But you can make it do diagonals. It's just a weird shape. Um, so yeah, that, that stick's all fine. But... Um, this guy is the star of the show as far as Suncom's concerned. Um, this one I've modified a little bit, I should say. It's so, like it did not originally have this nice coiled cable on it. I pulled that off of a Comrex controller. Um, I also modified it so instead of being a one, like instead of both of these buttons doing the same thing, uh, it now has two different fire buttons that can be that can be pressed independently of each other. So like, if I'm plugging it into a computer. Um, that supports the two buttons, then it will um, be able to tell that there are two different fire buttons that have different things uh, assigned to them. Um, so yeah, that's a change I made inside of here. I also removed the foam feet badly and uh, <laughs> did not re-adhere. Oh, here's one. Um, yeah, it has these nice little foam feet on it. Um, they're nothing too special, but yeah, that's what should be there. <laughs> I need to replace all of them. I don't know if there's an easy replacement available. Let me know in the comments if you are watching this still and there is something. Um, this also, strangely, for coming from the same company, Suncom. Yeah, made in USA, it says on this one. And I know some later ones were made in China. Uh, it's like, with the Tech 2, it, it is a well-known joystick, it seems. Like, if I look up joysticks, like, if I look up what is a good Atari joystick or something, this might come up pretty quickly. And um, seems to have a really huge following online. 
I can say that they are super rugged. And um, they're similarly sized to an official joystick. Maybe just a teeny bit bigger. And um, unlike this one, which is basically you have to hold it in your left hand because of where the fire button's located, uh, it's kind of hard to do right-handed like this. <laughs> um, unlike that, this had the two buttons um, so that, and originally the way it was set up, the two buttons were both mapped to the one fire button. But yeah, it had two buttons for ambidexterity. Um, so yeah, nice, nice things like that. It's very tight. Um, it provides a lot more clear movement than an Atari stick does, where you know when you've hit the end, you can't force it to go even further. Um, for reasons that will become apparent when I open it up. Um, but yeah, so th there's two variants of this. Um, well, first of all, there's two colors of the joystick. Um, the there's um, Some of these are beige. I've never seen a beige one in person, I just know they exist. Um, probably were colored that way to use like with the Commodore VIC-20 or something, that's just my guess. Or other beige computers, unlike the black Atari. Um, so yeah, the other weird thing, compared to the TAC-3 controller, which uses Phillips heads, um, you can't really see that, but just trust me, it has Phillips heads in it. <laughs> um, this uses some square-shaped screws, and you have to pull off um, two of the feet to get to them. Uh, the two feet you have to pull off to get to the screws are the ones on the uh, on the bottom side, farthest away from the fire buttons. Um, so you have to pull those two off, and they reveal two screw holes. And then there's a third screw right here, visible. Um, and so I don't have the correct square-shaped head, but if you put a flathead screwdriver of the correct size in diagonally, you can pull it out that way pretty easily. Uh, the first time I did it, it was stuck pretty tight, and I had to turn it kind of hard. But um, it didn't seem to damage the screws. Uh, let's see if I can get... <sighs> yeah, you can see that. It's sort of a square shape, then. And... Um, if you put diagonally into there, uh, then it can turn. Oh, let's focus is hard. Anyway, you, you can see that it turns when I put it in diagonally. You just have to trust me that it's going in diagonally. <laughs> yeah, so it has three of these. Um, that means two to go as opposed to the four Phillips heads of the Atari joystick, which is smaller. But yeah, you're about to see inside of a Tech 2 which is... I don't know if I'd call it a legendary joystick, but I'm sure some people would. Um, it is a nice joystick. Like, for being under 20 bucks when it retailed, like, super solid design. And um, not bad to play with either. So, um, yeah, I took the top off. Um, the masking tape is not original. I did that <laughs> when I did the mod, when I swapped the cable out and um, made it work with two distinct fire buttons instead of just being an ambidextrous controller. Because, I mean, I can use both my hands for a lot of stuff, but I'm not really ambidextrous. It's kind of a waste. Um, especially when I want to play games that need two fire buttons. Yeah, so um, I guess that's the brightness we're going with for now. If I pull this off, there's this plastic piece in the center, um, which is what the joystick kind of moves around inside. You can see, maybe you can already tell how this works. Um, so you can see that this stick here has a metal ball on it, and that um, this black wire which usually means ground in electronics, not always, but usually, um, runs to the stick and then is clipped down in place with this, um, with this kind of fork-like thing here. And um, so that, that is um, creating a ground. And so whenever you tilt the stick in any given direction, um, the stick, the ball will come into contact with um, one of these four points one or more of those four points. 
and um, in doing so, it will end up creating uh, what am I trying to say? It will end up um, shorting to these plates, which um, are then connected straight up into the wire here, into the cable. Um, so yeah, you tilt up the stick, the ball um, moves back and into this plate here. And then so this white wire is mapped to the up um, direction. Um, yeah, so there's two fire buttons. Fire buttons use the same kind of contacts, like hooked in on the plastic shell. And then they have um, these brass washers on the undersides of them, unlike the Atari sticks, which just press down on a steel plate. These actually, um, these actually have um, these washers come into contact with these points, and when they bridge between both of them, that triggers the fire button. So, and it makes a nice kind of loud noise because of the metal on metal contact. Suncom advertised that this was a tactile switch, I mean a tactile joystick. I mean, it kind of is, and that you can definitely tell when you've hit, like, when you've hit a contact point. But, um, I'd argue it's not just, well, I, I'm very particular about it, and it's easy to disengage the switch without realizing it. <laughs> or to rock the switch ever so slightly in one direction and lift it off of the pad. And maybe that's just because I need to clean the brass, actually. That's something people re recommend you do with these. Um, actually, I'm probably just going to cheat, and um, since the one side is dirty, like you can see, I'm just going to flip it and free cleaning, and then I'll have to clean both sides later. <laughs> but that might improve my um, contact for now. And I'll do the same thing here. Yeah, that should be fine. Hopefully these don't need cleaning after sitting all these years. And I'm not actually just making it worse by doing that. Anyway, um, yeah, so they just are nice little assemblies. It's really easy to take this thing all the way apart and put it back together. Um, one other cool thing, which I haven't mentioned yet, the, um, the way that this joystick centers itself is not with like a return spring or something like that and it's not with the switches themselves pushing back against the stick either like it is with the uh, tap 3 um, and it's I mean with the Atari stick it's just the um, the um, elasticity I guess is the term in physics of the uh, plastic shaft thing that wants to return back to its original position um, so that's what brings it back to center but this doesn't do that. Um, you can see this dome-shaped thing here, this black dome-shaped thing. That's a tire valve, um, which, well, if you're not quite aware what a tire valve means, um, it's from like a car or a bike. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, something like this. It's, uh, so you can see the threading on this end, that's where you inflate the tire from. Yeah, the, these are just our chrome, like, chrome sheathed tire valves. Um, yeah, so kind of like that, only longer. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's really all that the stick is, it's a tire valve. I mean, so the top of the stick is the top part of the tire valve, and um, this is just the chrome shaft where it would stick out for like older cars that used chrome everywhere. Um, and I'm not going to do it because I'm afraid I'll break something, and I don't have any reason to, but I believe it's possible to unscrew this ball from the top. Um, I could also break the tire valve doing this if it's really adhered tightly. But um, it should be possible to unscrew the ball and reveal the threads, which are not a standard thread. 
So if you're going to replace the tire valve because you have a broken one of these, which I don't know how you did that, but I guess it's possible. <laughs> um, if you're going to replace one of these, then um, just note that you'll have to figure out some solution for mounting the ball on top because I don't think anyone makes one the TR418 tire valve, which is what this is, um, with the, the kind of threading that this uses anymore. Um, but yeah, so it, it's literally just a tire valve, a little piece of rubber that likes to snap back into the center, <laughs> like it does on a tire. And I think that's a really clever design. I really appreciate whoever thought of that. Um, it's really cool. Um, so how does it feel, I guess, is something I need to answer still after I've put it back together. So like, yeah, I put this plas this black plastic piece back in. I've got the two button tops mounted. And the nice thing about, one of the nice things about this controller is that this can just drop down on from the, above. Bam, it's all good to go. Now uh, I'm gonna screw it together and I'm already forgetting what I just said. Like, how does it feel the use, I think, was what I was going to talk about. Um, pretty good. Um, it's dependable. So is the TAC-3, honestly. Like, the TAC-3, it did move the direction you wanted to move it pretty much when you were using it. And it wasn't, like, a bad stick. But this is much tighter. Um, is the best way to put it. So, the it has very little throw. Um, meaning that back and forth, forward and, well, forward, backward, left and right, um, you don't have to move it very far before it registers, and actually, in this case, before you can't move it any further. And it's very solid when, like, you hit that end point, because the shaft of this thing is metal. Um, there's a metal shaft going through the tire valve, down to that ball in the bottom. So this is all like a metal stick construction. So it's not flexible whatsoever apart from the rubber that's rocking it back and forth. So like you can hear that when, um, when you're using it. And um, this one also has kind of a box shape that you can move it in as opposed to like a pure circle. But it doesn't matter too much, honestly, because it's still easy enough to do diagonals with how short the throw is on this thing. Um, I like it a lot. I also think it looks incredibly handsome. So, I am a fan of the TAC-2, like everyone else seems to be. Um, however, it's not my favorite. So, um, that's mainly because it's easy for me to um, let go ever so slightly and not realize it and then stop moving in that direction or if I'm doing a diagonal to rock ever so slightly out of that diagonal and suddenly I'm going straight. Um, that's not a huge deal usually but it, it can happen. Also the fire buttons, it's easy for me when my thumb's getting tired to start letting it off to the side and then sometimes it'll stop registering properly. Maybe that's fixed now that I flip the washers around though. We'll see. I am going to demo these things um, in a little bit, um, but now I'm going to talk about, I think it's the last controller I have here to talk about, um, unless I think of something else soon. <laughs> um, the Comrex Commander, um, the CR301. Um, I have three of these because I like them a lot. And um, the first one had problems, so I thought, maybe I'll just buy another one and uh, have parts and a spare if I mess this up. And then I um, ended up getting a third because, uh, well, I, I, I mean, the second one... So at the same time that I bought some switches to make the second one I bought more reliable, I also bought a third stick just in case that didn't work out. And using the excuse, it's cheap, and no one cares about these things yet. So it's not like the TAC-3, I mean the TAC-2 where the prices sometimes get kind of high. Oh, if you want to talk about high prices, the um, Competition Pro, the HAP Competition Pro, is probably the king of that. Um, there's a new one being made it's somewhere in Germany, I think, but it's USB only, so you'd have to adapt it to use it with old systems. So the old original ones still go for a lot of money. 
compared to what I think they should. Um, yeah, so these have a few really nice things about them. Oh, and here's number three. Number three doesn't have a cable in it because I've been using it for parts after I lost a couple pieces. <laughs> Poor thing. But yeah, this is the original one I had and I kept losing parts from it. And so now it's just like the extras. Um, yeah, so Comrex apparently back in the 80s made monitors and printers and stuff as well for computers. Um, I've never seen a Comrex brand monitor, but um, I mean, maybe that's just because I was born in 1996. <laughs> so, and I don't know what happened to them in the end. Like, if they're the same as the Comrex company that exists now that sells software, or if it's something else entirely. Um, they do appear to have been headquartered in Torrance, Canada. So maybe that'll be findable. Uh, also, they have serial numbers, and I thought it was kind of cool that this one's number 388. So it's a pretty early one of this joystick that no one cares about. And the others are um, uh, 19,450 and 16,512. And of these three, the only one that worked totally correctly when I got it was actually number 388, so the earliest one, um, funnily enough. But, um, yeah, the others mostly worked, and um, I, I knew from trying to use them that there was a ton of promise there, but these are less reliable than the TAC-2. Like, if you, never, if you don't want to ever have to open anything up or solder anything, do not get a Comrex Commander, um, in my opinion. Or if you do, buy like 30 of them. <laughs> they don't come up for sale that often. I mean, there are usually a couple on eBay, but like, getting 30 of them will take a while. But yeah, the TAC-2 is much more reliable if you just want something that will always just work for you. If you don't mind um, doing some work, though, you can still get the parts you need to make these good again. Um, or at least the primary ones. So, I'm going to take apart the one that's already a parts joystick, just because they're kind of annoying to um, put back together sometimes. And I'd rather be a low-stakes one. Um, usually these have four screws holding them together. And I'll show you what makes these things awesome. Well, there's several things. Um, one of them is that from the factory, this switch here lets you switch between it, uh, both the fire buttons acting in the same way, or um, the buttons sending separate signals. Now, for whatever reason, they chose to send um, the second fire button out through pin 5. I know absolutely nothing that uses pin 5 as a secondary fire button, except for some Amstrad CPCs, and not even all of those. And that was an undocumented thing. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know what they were thinking there. Maybe they are just thinking, oh, we'll just sell adapters for each and every single person who wants to use these with two fire buttons. Um, but yeah, so... Normally, the sides of the case don't push each other apart, um, and that's because typically this circuit board with um, the joystick piece under it is stuck here, and then um, there are usually plastic rivets here and here um, on both of the, like, well, both of the plastic pegs here usually are kind of melted flat to hold this thing down. Um, however, I'm not sure if this one ever had them, and I'm um, actually because I don't, I just don't remember. But um, I know that the other two um, did have those. Um, but you don't need them to put it back together. Like it's just hard and annoying to put it back together without them. So yeah, that circuit board um, there has the switches on, and it just uses tacked switches. So they're not like, I think. Comrex call them micro switches, and technically, I guess you're allowed to call them micro switches, but it feels misleading to call them micro switches just because that's not what people think of when they think micro switch, even if it's technically true. Um, so, people usually think of like what's in the um, Epix controller or um, mouse click buttons, <laughs> that kind of thing, as a micro switch. Mouse click buttons being a miniaturized version of the micro switch, so mini micro, I guess you could call it. <laughs> um, but yeah, the things that make this cool. Um, 
So it's got uh, this return spring here, which um, is how it centers itself. So if you rock it, then um, it wants to return back to normal. And in order to do so, um, it'll, the spring will kind of push itself back into the center to try to straighten itself back out, and that centers the stick again. Um, so it allows for a ton of motion, like degrees of motion. So like, and you can also spin it in a full true circle and it'll work. And you don't need to tilt it all the way out to the side to even make the buttons register, just a little bit like, uh, like that. So you can get some really tight control with it, but if you ever feel like tilting it way out to the side just because you, you're kind of imagining that that's making your character move faster, then you can. Or you're going, nah, 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 nah. you can do that and it won't like damage anything to do that. Um, so like even after you click, you can exert more force and it's fine, which in my opinion is really awesome because like with this, you're either you're either um, pressing all the way against the side and you're um, making a connection or you're not making a connection at all. You can just like have it partially tilted and make a connection. So I just think it's more forgiving that way. And also, um, well, it's flexible. Um, so, and the way that that works is similar to um, well, a Fujitsu Peerless keyboard. Um, people call it the Peerless Switch um, because of how weird it is. But um, in a Fujitsu board like that, um, they have springs mounted on top of rubber domes and um, key sliders on top of the springs. Um, I don't have a Fujitsu board, but I have a very similar one. Let's see if I can find that really fast. might be buried. Yeah, I think that's buried. I don't think I'm going to find it um, particularly quickly. Yeah. I mean, it's here somewhere, but um, I don't see it. So we're going to skip that for now. But um, I can maybe show you a picture of it. I don't recommend these keyboards, by the way. They have a lot of problems. Maybe if you can get one brand new, they're okay, but Model M is just better if you want something clicky and uh, tactile. But yeah, so um, they have this setup where, yeah, you can see it here. So they have a slider. Um, well, they have this little sleeve thing that the spring st sits in, and then the spring pushes down on the sleeve, which pushes down the rubber. And so you don't have to push the key down all the way before the spring is exerting enough force to buckle the rubber here. And um, so like if you push it down about halfway, it'll click and then you'll know, okay, that key was registered. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a nice design like that. Um, hmm. The um, ones in my keyboard are Olivetti and they are, um, from an AT&T 6300 computer, which is an Olivetti M24, but rebranded and made to look a little bit less um, pretty, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, I'm not seeing any like X-ray things, but you you might you probably know what I mean now. So um, your 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 but your key, you're not directly pressing down on the button. There is a spring sitting between you and the button. Um, and yeah, so there's four springs on the underside of this. And each one of those sits on top of one of these um, tactile switches. And when you tilt in one direction enough, it clicks the switch. And that's the basic um, principle behind it. 
Now, um, the problems, well, there are a few problems with these as they age. Um, the big problem I've had is that these um, switches, they, I mean, being pressed off-center, and they are pressed slightly off-center, not by a lot, but a little. Um, being pressed a little bit off-center, um, they develop some little kinks, or something I'd call them, where they don't necessarily register when they're pressed down from an edge, only when they're pressed on the center. Um, when they're brand new, it's fine. It's totally fine. But um, these things are 30 plus years old, so maybe not as fine. I guess they're coming up on 40 now. Wow. <laughs> it's a little scary. Anyway, um, yeah, so the way that you s assemble one of these again, um, is relatively simple. You need to um, make sure that the return spring is centered on the stick here. Um, and the, the, the return spring is slightly conical, so like one end is wider than the other. You want the wider end to uh, go down on the spring like that, on the, uh, on the uh, joystick itself, and the narrower end to be up top. Then um, with the top of the case, you kind of slide it in, and um, you'll see that there's this little um, gap up here. And um, that's where this peg in the joystick goes. That's how you align it. Um, and then I pull it flat like that. Um, yeah, I pull it as flat as I can, basically. Um, and normally there are switches in here already, so I'm, I'm skipping that step. But you pull it flat, and then you have the um, circuit board kind of aligned down below. It doesn't have to be perfect, because as you're sliding it around, it'll fall into place. Um, you might take it, it might take a couple tries, though. Oh, I have it upside down. Um, yeah, so I have the stick being pulled up still most of the way. And that's because you're, you can't re-adhere the um, circuit board, like you can't, well you maybe could once, but like, you won't be able to repeatedly do that. Um, remount the circuit board with the plastic melted tabs like it originally was. Um, so this return spring will push the two sides apart of the case, um, but yeah, you just have to kind of wiggle it so that the circuit board is lying even, and then it will eventually line up and pop together. And that's when you screw it in, before my thumb starts getting sore from pinching it together. <laughs> Holding it together entirely on its own. Alright, once one screws in, you can relax a little bit. You don't have to keep a ton of pressure on it anymore. And you'll need to make sure while you're doing that that the cable um, up top is aligned where it comes out. And I actually, I actually multiple times um, broke wires inside of here while, while doing this because I was taking it apart so many times trying to figure out what I needed to do to fix it. Um, so the, yeah, that's not ideal, obviously. Um, also, the springs on the underside of the joystick itself might need realigning or repositioning just a little bit if you're noticing that it is kind of biased in one direction or the other. Um, but you'll you'll know what you'll know what that means if you're having that problem. Um, but basically, it's where if you were to tilt right, for instance, it might snap way too easily compared to how far you have to make it travel t to the left in order for that side to snap. Um, and that usually is because of the springs themselves. Um, or if you've replaced the switches, because the switches might not be pushed down all the way on one side or the other of the board. That's the other cool thing, or the good thing, I should say. Maybe not cool thing. It is nice. Uh, I just don't know if cool is the right word. Um, you can still get the switches to um, replace the switches that are in this, and um, they're not too expensive or anything. They're a commodity part that's still being made. It's not new old stock. It's new new stock. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I thought I had um, one or two of these just sitting around. 
Um, oh, here's one. Yeah. So the um, these switches, um, it uses six of them, one under each of these buttons up top, and um, then four for the directional inputs. And um, you might be able to see, if I focus this right, that this, in the light, that this switch is just a teeny bit scratched on the top, or dinged or dented or something. And uh, that's because of the, that's entirely because of the um, springs pushing down on top of it, I think. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see it, but there's a slight scarring on it. I think this controller was well used, whichever one I ended up pulling this from. <laughs> um, so one of the remaining controllers has new um, buttons in it, and the other one is totally original still. This one's totally original. This one has new buttons in it. Um, I'm considering opening this up, although I'm afraid I'll break a wire again. Huh. Yeah, I'll open it. So, um, I'm not gonna go too deep into this, I'm just gonna show you that I replaced the buttons. You need a soldering iron to do that, of course, and, um, so that's not ideal, but you can still get them. And I actually replaced them with a, um, different variant of the Switch, even though the original variant is still being sold. Oh, and I'll tell you what that variant is, actually, that's a good idea. It's the Omron, um, B3F series. Um, and I think the one I ended up going for was the B3F5001, which is a um, gold-plated contact switch, so it's supposed to be more reliable, and we'll see if that means it lasts longer and doesn't oxidize as much. Okay, yeah, so um, you can see that the switch tops are blue in there, that's because I replaced them. I'm not opening it any more than that, because I'm afraid I'll mess it up, because I got it working just beautifully, and I don't want to mess that up again. Yeah, I think that's good. As long as that holds up, it's good. It took me multiple tries just closing it up to get it all to feel just right. Um, because it's not it's not like being held the circuit board's not being held down the same way anymore. But this does work and it works nicely. I've played a lot of Toho on this. Also, it has a coiled cable. So yeah, I'm just really a fan of the Comrex, even though it's not um, not problem-free by any means. I've had one out of three that worked totally fine, and the others were kind of inter intermittently working or had other issues. Alright, that feels fine. We're good. So I replaced all six switches in here with um, new ones, and the gold contact switches cost more money than the um, regular replacement, but I'll show you what the replacement is. Omron. Yeah. So the original switches were also made by Omron, so this is just, they're still making the same series of switch they were making in the 80s, which is pretty cool. Even if it's understandable, because it's a very um, common design still. Although the 12, mi 12 millimeter ones I don't see as often. Um, yeah, B3F 4000, 4005, 5000, and 5001. Um, and then... Yeah, we the ones that, that are in this joystick do not have a ground terminal. If you can get the ones with the ground terminal cheaper, do it and just break the ground terminal off if um, they're, it's causing any problems for you. But um, yeah, either of these will work. Um, just make sure you get the ones with the correct um, pressure. Uh, let's see, where's the ordering info? 
Okay, yeah, so make sure it's the 1.27 Newton um, force models, um, which is B3F 4,000 numbers ending with zero, 5,000 numbers ending with zero, and the 5,001. Um, yeah, so you can see 10 million operations minimum is the rating for the 5001, which is what I got. And um, I think the original switches in here were the 4000. The, it notes the color here, I think. Yeah, plunger color. Here we are. So, um, yeah, this is the nice table. So... I believe that the original buttons were B3F4000, and the one I put in was B3F5001. But yeah, there, there's, you can get more B3F4000 switches if you want, because they are far cheaper than the 5001s are. I paid a premium for the 5001. Like, I paid 10 bucks or so for those six switches, is what I mean. And you can get them much cheaper with the... Uh, four thousands in probably larger quantities um, I'm not buying them in the minimum packing unit I bought mine from digikey which let me just buy six of them all right so yeah that's the Amron b3f switch series and um, they're pretty good um, they're not like amazing on their own, they're tactile switches. I usually hate those things, but the way they're used here I really like. And when they're working, they're working awesome. So yeah, um, now after I've foamed at the mouth about that for a while, um, I guess I'm going to set this up to play um, and demo some stuff for you. Um, how will I do that? Okay. It's actually already mostly set up. So, um, I'm just going to play it on the PC-98, I guess. I'll switch to the wider lens. And... There it goes. There we are. Okay. So, here we go. Um, let's start with the 2600 CX40 joystick, even though in Toho that means I won't be able to fire at all, so it'll probably be a pretty short game. I'll only be able to bomb. <laughs> I just don't have my Atari out and ready. Okay. And so I'll pull up the screen here. And I will move this one down. And shrink it a bit. All right. So yeah, this will be a pretty short game probably, but maybe I'll be able to see how good this thing's holding up. It's been a long time since I even tried to use this. So this isn't enough to make it go. You have to push. You have to push, in my opinion, harder than is really ideal. Um, so like, th 
that requires a lot of force to move. Anyway, we'll try it. Fire button's always fine on these things, it's just the directional inputs that are bad. And of course I'll only be able to bomb, so <laughs> yeah. I'll, I guess I'll hold space on the keyboard. Ah. Ah. Already, I'm sore. And that's just the way these things are, and they don't like doing diagonals either. I mean, they can do diagonals, but... Ah. That's painful. Why is that going so slow in the capture? I'll have to fix that. Um, okay, so let's figure out why that's going so slow in the capture. I think that shouldn't take long. Alright, I'm back and I fixed it. It didn't take too long, but I decided to do it off camera. Um, Alright, so yeah, this one is much easier. Even though it's wobbly and everything, like, you just have to, once you're past the wobbling part, it's like once you've gotten it to the edge of where you start to feel resistance, you just need to bump it a little bit, and it goes. So it's far superior to the official Atari joystick in that respect. Um, not that that's particularly hard to be. It's competent. But yeah, there's a reason you can get like two Atari six, CX40 joysticks for 10 bucks. Huh. Hmm. Well, the direction isn't working. I wonder if that's... That's probably something I did when I was digging around in there. It should work. Just take my word for it, guys. <laughs> I probably broke a wire when I was picking around in there. Anyway, this is still a superior joystick, and if you're okay with it just having the one button, um, I do highly recommend it over the official Atari stick, although basically anything is an upgrade from an official Atari stick. But the TAC-3 is not bad, it's a leaf switch uh, design, and it's pretty dependable, just uh, if you don't mess with it like I do. <laughs> now we'll get into the fun ones, which I am certain will work. So we're going to do the TAC-2 now. We'll see how good the fire buttons are after I, swatched, after I swapped the um, washers on them, or flipped them around. Yeah, that, that's just nice. Does exactly what I want. Okay, so... There we go. And yeah, this one's nice and quiet, which is the big thing I keep it for, I think. Yeah, if I let off the switch too much, then it does stop firing. Y you, um, if you're pressing down from an angle, right now it seems to be working fine. Probably because I swap. I am using clean washers now. But, uh, yeah, so it's much more fluid to control with than the uh, Atari stick and it's much tighter than the TAC-3 and feels just higher quality in general. Yeah. So, yeah, I can, I can use this, although I did find after playing through most of a round of a game with, with um, this stick that when I swapped to the Comrex stick like, it, that was why I needed to push me over the top <laughs> and um, actually beat um, the game. Yeah, just buy the Comrex and you'll beat the game. Yeah, don't listen to me when I say things like that. I'm just tell you my lived experiences. <laughs> but I think it's totally frick. That was me. That was just my fault. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's totally possible to um, be amazing with this joystick. It, it comes down to taste. And for me, I prefer the Comrex. I feel like I don't have to push down as hard on the buttons either. And they will, um, and they'll do what I want them to do. Um, because I don't have to keep them held all the way down. Like, these buttons click before they hit the bottom, like, long before they hit the bottom. So. Okay, it's pressed in enough to click. Then I press it down the rest of the way. <laughs> so, yeah. They don't take too much. But yeah, I'll play through this boss with the um, Tac 2 at least. And if it's modified so that you can have both fire buttons, it's pretty great. Mine is modified to use the same pinout as the Comrex, which means that um, I need to use the adapter that I built for the Comrex joystick, because nothing I know uses pin 5 for the second fire button. Um, it's just, since I'm stealing the cable from the Comrex and I didn't want to try to crimp my own uh, D-sub connections, that was just the easiest thing to do. It's worth noting, though, that you can actually unscrew these. Um, the plugs and rewire them internally um, so that is a very nice thing about them for the Comrex as well um, the Suncom one you could not do that with but yeah so if you have a crimping tool then that makes it very easy to reassign the pins to something more reasonable and I have the crimping tool I just don't have the I just don't know where the ring things are that I need to uh, to uh, they're like the electric contacts themselves, the things that you crimp to the wires. I don't know where those are. I know I have them. Just not sure where. <laughs> First world problems. Okay. Yeah, so I'm able to do diagonals pretty easily with this, which is a big problem for a lot of sticks, actually. And I got, I bought a whole bunch of joysticks in one lot because the TAC-2 was one of the sticks in the lot. And um, I sold most of them off at the ham radio convention except this and the Comrex. But I originally bought the um, listing for the TAC-2 and then just happened upon the Comrex because it was also in there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased with the TAC-2 for sure, and I would recommend it to people, um, although if you're looking for something new, I I'm sure you can get something new, like the Competition Pro sticks that are being made now are USB, but like, if you're trying to get something new for old computers, I feel like there has to be other options out there that aren't, like, bad. <laughs> Maybe Bico stuff? I don't know if anyone still makes clones of those. But yeah, these things haven't been made in years, to my knowledge. Probably decades. Multiple decades. So. Thankfully, they don't break too easily. So the ones that are out there are probably going to stay out there unless people get rid of them, like, by throwing them away or something. But, yeah. Alright. But yeah, because I feel like I need to push down harder than I probably actually have to on the fire button on this, I do, um, I do find myself cramping up a little bit more than with the Comrex, which lets me be much more gentle and still feel like I'm going to get things done. Also needing to push it all the way up against the edge sometimes, even though you don't really need too much force to push it to the edge.
There we are. I've improved at this game. I mean, I know it's... Uh, I say that and then I run right into a bullet. Well, I'll blame the joystick for that. Yeah. <laughs> Still, I have improved a lot at this game. Compared to the, the first time I played through it on the stream. Or on the recording. Not really a stream unless it's live, I guess. Hopefully you can hear me. <laughs> I'm gonna check that. Hmm. Alright, yeah, everything was fine. I just uh, was wondering if I had the audio amped way too high so you couldn't hear a word I was saying again. So it's still not properly um, set my system up so that I'm recording the voiceover separately. It's still being mixed live. So, um, yeah. But I guess I'm really not feeding the sound through and having it be recorded, so that's actually kind of perfect. While I was away, um, I ate a sandwich, and um, I also um, <coughs> read a little bit more about these sticks and remembered Oh yeah, there's that other thing. So some TAC2 joysticks um, don't have the chrome stem on them, and those are um, worse sticks, like they, um, according to most. And they are made in China, not that that's what makes them worse, but doesn't help. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the big thing is... Um, They replaced the tire valve with something else, and um, they replaced the uh, washers under the um, buttons with part of the coil acting as the conductor. Um, and there's no chrome on the uh, valve stem, because there's no valve stem anymore. So it's just a black stick instead. And the ball up top is not screwed in anymore. Anyway, these are seen as inferior. Oh, and the buttons on them are darker red. Um, anyway, these ones are seen as inferior to the um, original um, American-made ones, which are like the one on the left in this picture and like um, this beige one here. Yeah. So, anyway. Let's go back to what we were doing. Um... I think I left off. I think this is right where we left off. Alright. Yeah. Okay, so I switched over to the Suncom now. I mean, not the Suncom, but the um, Comrex. And I can do this with just my thumb, just lightly tilting with my thumb, which I love. I think that opening and reclosing it did change the feel of the stick a little. It's still perfectly usable, but I'm probably going to open it up again after this. The acoustics sound a little different every time I open and close it. There we are. The uh, clicks are a little bit uneven, like uh, some directions sound louder than others. which bothers me ever so slightly. Alright.
yeah, backing up barely gives any sound at all. That's something I'm gonna have to fix. It's not affecting the actual control very much at all. That's still fine. Like I said, if you're not willing to open your controllers up and mess with them, and uh, you're afraid of soldering especially, comics might not be the right choice, unless you can find a really nice one, or a few of them. I'm going to switch to the other one. Oh wait, no. This is one that's never been messed with, so yeah, okay. That, that's why. So the one that I worked on probably is still as consistent as before. I was messing with- I was using the low serial number one, which I barely ever use, so... That's probably why. Alright. Yay. This is the one with the gold contact switches that I popped into it. Yeah, that's normal. There we go. Horns really going on that ambulance. Great timing for an ambulance distraction. Okay. Diagonals are super easy with this. Ah, okay. Okay, I made it. She did the, the threes. Ah, fuck. I say and then I die. Okay. That's okay. Ah, that was me again. <laughs> Trying to go where I shouldn't. That's what I get. Oh, me again. Falling apart suddenly. It's my posture. I usually do sit playing with the stick down in my lap. But I want to do it where you can see it, just a little. Because it's not really meant to be a Toho Let's Play. Alright, we'll see if I can recover here. If you're a kid and you're trying to like hide that you're playing video games from your parents at night, don't get one of these. Get a tack too. <laughs> if your parents are cool though, yeah, get one of these. Oop, there we are. Ah, <laughs> my bad again. I'm really doing that a lot right now. Maybe it's performance anxiety. As you can see from the high score, I can get quite a bit higher than this. Ah, hate those guys. Bomb time. 
That way I don't have to deal with it anymore. start getting hammered again. Joystick's going out of view now, so I can focus and hold myself in my usual posture. Wasn't sure I'd make that one. Uh. This fight is always hard for me. killed myself. Great. Oh well. I swear I'm better with this thing than with attack. <laughs> I was already dying more often than usual with attack too. But anyway. Yay. Um, let's see. I think that was all the sticks. Yeah, that was all the sticks. So um, yeah, I'm still a huge fan of these things. 360 degrees motion. Clicky. Don't have to push the buttons all the way for them to register. Um, it has a switch that allows you to use multiple, like both the fire buttons as discrete inputs. Um, and they're pretty cheap still, or at least the ones I got were. Um, yeah, so I, I, I recommend the Comrex um, CR-301 Commander joystick. Um, the Deluxe version is some kind of analog stick. I've not got one, um, but it seems like it's a very different beast. It could be amazing, but I've just not got any experience with it. So um, yeah, the CR301 I recommend. The TAC2 I recommend. Uh, TAC3, well it's, it's better than an Atari stick. Atari stick, do not recommend. <laughs> I guess that's it for the video. I think I covered everything. If I think of something else, I might make an addendum, but for now, I think that's it. So, see you guys. I'll probably play some more video games now, off of off screen, and suddenly be a god. But, yeah, have a good day. <laughs>